So, hi. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? For those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg Short. Uh, my wife Amy and I raised our kiddos through the roads, and we've been here around 14 years, and I'm just excited to be here. I am so glad that we have a place like the roads to call our home. And I know if you've been here any time at all, you're like, man, I'm telling you, God's doing some amazing and incredible things here. And some other incredible things that we're doing that I don't want to forget is we want to welcome those from Mount Carmel, our campus that's, that's listening online, watching online. We, we want to welcome Carlinville, and we have a group in Evansville that's watching, and guess what? We now also have a group in Effingham that's also watching. So could you give them a warm welcome this morning? Also a product of your giving right there, amen. God is moving. He is on the move. And so a couple weeks ago, Pastor uh, had texted me and asked that, uh, you know, if I was available to speak this morning. And I'd already had an agreement with the Lord. I have preached, pastored, spoke, went to the nations for a little over 20 years now. And, and I've already given God my yes. It's just easier that way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like, oh, Lord, are you sure? You get that gut check? I was the, I was the kid that when they said, hey, you need her to do a speech for class. Yeah, just, you just put the zero down for me, okay? I'm not standing up in front of anybody, so God has a great sense of humor, right? Be very careful when you say, I'll never do that, right? Be very careful. So I'm just so thankful for Pastor and and just, again, to get to be at the roads because we've got it good. Amen. we got it good. He does send his love. Um, he's speaking uh, elsewhere this morning. And so um, we got an opportunity and to minister to one another, to minister to Jesus and to minister to the Word of God. Do you have your Bibles with you or your tablet or your phone? Would you turn with me to the book of John chapter 1? Yeah. Excited about the Word. I love that. I love, is it just me or every time we do a scripture reference and say, okay, turn to this. Do you want to say, woo? Every once in a while you might hear me do that. It's like, what in the world? Who was that? Who does that? We only do one woo, okay? (laughs) But inside of me, I'm just like, I want to just woo every bit of scripture. Every time we flip to another scripture, I want to go, woo, that's good. I'm excited about God's word. We're going to talk about God's word this morning. It's a good subject, I think, for us to talk about. The Lord had, so obviously, like I said, I get the gut check. All right, I'm going to speak. Lord, what do you want to say? That's a big deal. That's a big deal. You don't need something funny. You don't need to be entertained this morning. You don't need just whatever I think. You need the word of God, amen. You need what he wants you to hear. So I'm confident this morning that he's given that to me, and I'm just praying that it comes clear for you guys (laughs) that he is able to use that, okay? And so we're going to look... In John chapter 1, now this is the cool thing, I really like John. John's a pretty cool dude, and he's opening up, he's writing this, right? And he is, this is his opening statement to us, okay? Starting with verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3 says, All things were made through him, without him, Nothing was made that was made. And here we go, verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, in this passage, who do you think John is referring to? Jesus, right, absolutely. I'm going to need some participation, guys. You've got to help me out. That's fantastic. He's talking about Jesus. Well, that's kind of an interesting concept, right? The word is Jesus. This is Jesus. We get that, right? We get to have that personally. So in the beginning, have you heard of that before somewhere? In the beginning. Has anybody heard of that somewhere? So it's it's a new year, a new year, new us, right? One of the things a lot of believers would like to do is to say, you know what? I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to read the Bible this year. And so you may have started a plan, and some plans kind of jump around to kind of help keep you motivated and stuff because when you get to numbers And you get the Chronicles, and you're just like, oh, Lord, I need a Holy Ghost Red Bull. I need you to help me out. Get me through numbers. I can't pronounce this guy's name. And he's the son of somebody that still can't pronounce his name either, 
right? But let me tell you, so do I have any Caneo students in the house this morning? Yeah, yeah come on now. So we're learning that Old Testament, we're going to find Jesus entirely throughout the Old Testament, and that order and names matter. That's not fluff. The Lord wasn't like, yeah, we got to fluff this thing up. We need to make a thicker book. It's not big enough. There's reasons why these names are in there, and the order of these names are important. So I'm learning, and so I'm trying, like, Lord, I'm... It's, it's, like eating, it's like eating the shredded mini wheats, right? You got the frosted side and you've got the wheat side. And it, can't we just get the frosted part, right? I just, I don't want the wheat. So give me the frosted part, Lord. Sometimes that's it. But hey, it's good, right? It's good and it builds us up. There's some of the good stuff in there that the Lord wants us to receive. And so you don't have to turn there. I've got it on the wall for you, but I'm going to, and it's all the way to the left on your Bible. Genesis 1. I mean, we've already read it's like, so Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I've read that a lot, and I'm sure you have too. If you've been in church very long, you've at least heard it. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, it's like God, you know, I kind of hear in my head like the, the starting pistol, pow, life starts, boom, the world as we know it starts, right? That's what that means. That, that's what that verse is about. But what is really cool that in ancient Hebrew, ancient Hebrew is pictograph symbology pictures, the words are pictures, and they have a lot of meaning to them, and they have a number associated with them, and I'm, I would love to like totally lay that out for you, but I just wanted to give you a teaser that maybe you'll chase it down, is that from Genesis 1-1, in ancient Hebrew, and it's from the right to the left is how you read it, and you see the pictures, and, and you know what the pictures and the numbers, what they mean, it gives you the plan of salvation right there. From the beginning to the cross, and if, I'm, if I remember correctly, the last symbol is a cross. It just, I mean, I'm getting goose pimples so big I can pet them. I mean, that just blows my mind that from the very start of this thing, Jesus already knew what he would have to do. But yet we're going to go ahead and do creation anyway. Yet we're going to go ahead and make man in our image anyway. We're going to go ahead and do this thing, even though from the beginning I'm going to know what I need to do. And that first symbol uh, the word, I'll have it on the screen here, the, the word in Hebrew is, I'm not going to pronounce it right, so forgive me, it's Bereshit. And so that first symbol is a floor planter, like it's a tent, okay? And then the very next symbol is the chief, the first, the firstborn, the first one. And so in that symbology, then it's the son was in the tent and now he come out. Yeah. Jesus has come out and said, all right, Father, let's do this. And when you follow that all the way through, it takes you all the way to the cross. In Genesis 1, 1, doesn't that just blow your mind? That is awesome. I love how the Father loves us. He knows your faults. He knows what you're going to do, and he loves you anyway. It's kind of hard to love like a spouse that messes, you know, makes you mad or a friend that hurts your feelings or something. It's like, ugh. right? We get a little frustrated. But I'm so thankful for the unconditional grace and love of God. Yeah. Amen. It's so good. And so what we're doing this morning, we're, we're, gonna, we're setting us, ourselves up a foundation, right? So Jesus, from the beginning, he is the word, right? The word became flesh, right? The word was in the beginning, and the word, everything was made, was made through him. So there's a pretty big emphasis on the word, right? So the word's important, obviously, right? And so we want to get that. We want to grasp that because we know that the word of God is important. I mean, you're here at church, right? Or you're listening online. Hey, I know the word's important, Greg. I get that. It's important, okay? Um, but the thing about it is, what I believe that the Lord had put on my heart to share with you this morning is that we have such great access to his word, don't we? I mean, you can go on Amazon, you can get a lot of translations, shapes, size, colors, fonts, notes, no notes, commentary. I mean, and not only that, you know, like I said, and when you go on Amazon probably, or wherever it is you're going to purchase your Bibles, I'm not promoting Amazon here, okay? You know, you grab your, your, your device or your tablet. And what's funny is I made a comment earlier in first service. I'm like, tablet, iPads, does, does anybody use those anymore? I mean... I mean, maybe I'm not a real good tech guy. I've been in technology for a while, but I mean, it seems like you can do everything on your phone. I was telling my, I plug my, uh, my truck's old enough now. When I plug it into my truck, I get a little iPod symbol on my, 
on my dashboard, I'm like, does anybody use an iPod anymore? I mean, your phone pretty much does it all. And we spend so much time with this thing. I feel like my hand should like permanently be shaped like this. Unfortunately, I do, but we do. We have great access is the point I'm trying to make here. What's funny is, is somebody said, you don't think we use tablets anymore? There's like five up here. I'm like, oh, sorry. So somebody's going to edit first service, and then you're going to see the little red arrows go ding, 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 ding. When, when I do the, the, does anybody use a tablet anymore? I just don't see it, okay? So all you tablet folks, I guess you got to step it up. Say, so I'll, I'll use one. Maybe I need one because maybe I won't need these if I use a tablet. I don't know. Let's, let's get rid of that rabbit. We'll shoot him, or if you, you're with PETA, we will cage him up, and we will release him out into the wild. He'll be okay, okay? So we'll get rid of that rabbit trail there. All right. So we have great access to the word. So what's the problem? You would think, man, we're pretty good then. We've got all this access to the word. We've got an incredible, we got an incredible pastor who studies so diligently and hard and long to help, to help us, right, to teach, to equip, and to preach the word of God so that it'll have an effect on our life. And uh, what the Lord was kind of sharing with me is like, yeah, he said, uh, so what did Chad preach on last week? Well, um, it was good. I know it was, re- it was really good. Um, Jesus? I mean, we, we, we expose ourselves to the word a lot. And if you don't, I want to encourage you to do that. But exposing ourselves to the word is, we gotta, there's got to be more to it than that, Right? We can't just, so we're going to travel, we're going to do a little bit of of, uh, gymnastics here in our Bibles, okay? Let's go over to the book of James. Just turn right, flip past Hebrews, he's right after Hebrews, and you might be like, where's Hebrews at? I get it, but see if you're going to Caneo, you'll learn that, that you'll learn your books of the Bible, you'll learn the order of your books of the Bible, and you'll learn how to spell them right. If you don't, you don't get a good grade, Okay? (laughs) And so you got to do that. It's good. It's good. I still struggle, guys. Why I don't have a Bible with all the little tabs in it, I don't know. Maybe that's my next, uh, my next uh, upgrade. Hey, I was trying to give you time to get to James, okay? All right. So let's look at the first chapter of James. We're going to start in verse 21. It says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive the meekness, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But here we go. We want to pay attention to 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Well, just like last Sunday's sermon. Right? We had a good word, and that word will hit us in our heart. I'm like, Lord, that's good. I needed that. Thank you, Lord. That's a good, that was such a good word. Or sometimes it's a word, and it's like, God's like, hey, buddy, Greg. Hey, you heard, you heard what Pastor said, right? You heard that word, that scripture? I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about that person you've not, you've not been able to forgive. But, Lord, I don't know if I'm ready to go there. You don't know what they did, Lord. Of course, he knows what they did, right? But you internalize all this stuff. You'll hear the word of the Lord. And you know, you know when you're knower, God is trying to speak to you about that situation. You know that he's dealing with you about that, right? And he's inviting you. He's knocking on your heart. It's like, so James is admonishing the church, hey, we, we can't just hear the word. Is it good to hear the word? You have to hear the word. But what are we doing with it? What are we doing after we hear the word, especially the words that knock on our heart's door, especially the scriptures that start to get in our our junk a little bit, that start to start to meddle a little bit in our affairs? Well, Lord, I mean, surely God wouldn't have me do that. Well, what did his word say? And how is Holy Spirit wanting me or you to respond to that word? Amen. All right. And so there, so we've got to hear the word, right? So we know that we've got to be more, sorry, we've got to be more of a doer than not just a hearer only. Just like a man that looks in the mirror, the Bible says. Hopefully you shaved both sides, right? Well, do you remember if you did or not? Well, you know, if you, if you don't remember, it's kind of like the same thing it's saying here. 
So we need that word. We need to be a doer also. Okay? So we're going to backpedal up into James. We're still in chapter 1. We're going to go to verse 2 next when we're talking about the word. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience. That's our favorite thing. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Okay, James, I got you. So our faith is going to be tested. Well, how do we get faith? Well, we know that in Romans 10, 17, you don't have to turn there. I've got it up on the screen for you. But faith comes by hearing the word of God, right? By hearing and hearing the word of God. So we've heard the word. And now we're beginning to adopt it. I don't know about many of you, but I got the joy of turning 50 last year. It's hard for me to say, still. I'll be 51 this year, but 50 is a big deal, right? And one of my favorite scriptures is, by his stripes, I am healed. When you get a little older, Ted, you know, things just don't work like they used to, right? And I'm standing on that, right? But guess what? That word gets tested. If I have faith to stand on the word of God that tells me by his stripes I'm healed, well, why can't the devil just leave me alone? I'm believing the word of God, but what does he do? If he did it in the Garden of Eden with Eve, you surely won't die. God's a God of love. He'll let you off the hook. It's okay. Go ahead. Eat of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not a big deal. You won't surely die. If he did it in the beginning, he's going to do it now. And he does, doesn't he? I'm sure y'all can testify. We'd be here for weeks being able to testify. Well, Greg, you know, I heard the word of the Lord. And I, I want to adopt it and I want to believe it. But then when I start to pray and stuff and then all this stuff happens. You know, I'm, I'm believing and standing on the word of God for my healing, but then these symptoms come on, and this doctor report comes on, and I, I just, I don't, maybe it's just not for me. Well, what do, who does that, whose voice does that sound like? That doesn't sound like what I'm reading in here. That sounds like somebody else is trying to get me to eat that fruit, right? Trying to get me to, to buy into that doubt, to buy in that God's word's not alive and living, to buy in that that God doesn't watch over his word, word to perform it. So I'm like, okay, okay, Father, I see where we're going here. I see that, it, yeah, we've we got to stand. We've got to, keep, we got to keep standing. Has anybody ever played King of the Hill when you were younger? You know, you, you know, when we're kids, either it's a dirt pile or a rock pile, or I guess here we use a piano or something. We'd, Jared would probably be mad at us. <laughs> but we won't do that. But, you know, when you're playing King of the Hill, you're, you're like, you're the king of the hill, right? So what happens? Your cousins, your friends, your buddies, they come up and they rush you and they try and push you down and knock you off, right? And they keep going. Everybody, everybody's coming at you at once. Don't you feel like that in life sometime? Hallelujah. I was at church on Sunday and the pastor told me the victory that I can have in the word of God and the freedom that I can have in the word of God. Hallelujah. I'm, that's fine. I'm going to take that. I'm going to, Jesus, yes, Lord, I'm going to take you at your word. All of a sudden, bam, what's going on? Jesus, you said, you said in your word, why is this happening to me now? What's going on, right? And we're just like, whoa. And so I'm like, okay, Father, how are we, how are we going to dig into this? How, how can we show what you want us to do? Because this happened, am I alone? Has that only happened to me? So it's a pandemic, right? So what do we do with this? What are, what are we going to do? I mean, we're supposed to be, you know, we're priests. We're royal priesthood. And that's kind of weird for us to think. Priests, what are you talking about, you know? We're because of Jesus and who we are. We're sons and daughters of the king, yeah. right? I mean, I've never been a son and daughter of the king on the earth, but I'm the son and I'm a son of, of the king of the universe, right? And so there's, there's things that you have rights to as a son or a daughter of the most high God and as a, a, a king, right? So we, he, calls, he calls us out a royal priesthood. And my Lord Jesus, that's just kind of a little weird. But I want to know what, go on. What are you trying to say to me here? What, what do you want me to know about that? And so we, we know that Jesus is the word. We know that only and through and by him, everything that was made. 
We know that Jesus is focal to us operating in life, right? That we need the word, that he's telling us we just can't hear it, that we've got to do it. So here's something I do remember about last Sunday's message, okay? And if you haven't watched that one, if you weren't here, or you, maybe you just need to rewatch it. But pastor used the illustration of when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt and they were going into the promised land, right? It's now their time to go. And, he's, and the Lord has told them, I've subdued your enemies before you. Don't be afraid of them. I'm taking care of it for you, right? And it's like, oh, great, cool. I like that. I just get to waltz right on in there and, and just take, take the land and inherit the land. Well, if, if you've read that story, it's not really how that happened. <laughs> it's not really how that went down. If you remember Pastor's sermon from last week. So can you just imagine they, they, they roll up to Nineveh, not Nineveh, Jericho. Yeah, I don't know why I said Nineveh. I got Nineveh on the mind. So they roll up to Jericho. Jericho is this big, humongous city. I mean, they tell us it's so big because the walls are so wide and thick that they, they're, doing, they're drag racing uh, chariots around the top of this thing. That's pretty big, right? I mean, you can only imagine how vast this is. Well, Israel shows up, and they look, and then the city's full of people. Their army's still there. You know, I'm, I'm sure it didn't play out like, oh, hey, Israel, uh, we knew you were coming, and so we were just trying to make sure everything was ready for you guys. You know, and make sure you're going to enjoy your stay here at, at, at Jericho. And so we're going, to, we're, we're going to open the gate soon and we're going to leave. And we're just going to walk, let you all guys just waltz in and take it because God said so, right? No, well, that's not what happened, is it? That's not what happened at all. Israel ended up having to do kind of some different things to get past Jericho, right? I mean, they're walking around, they're blowing trumpets. The, the, on the seventh day, they're shouting with a great shout. If you know the rest of the story, the walls come down. And, but wait a minute. I thought God gave it to them. And they show up. And this, it wasn't just in this case. It was when they would have a battle with King David. King David would say, Lord, do we go? The Lord would say, yep, go. I've given them into your hand. They show up. Well, there's the army. So, well, wait a minute. And they want to fight, Lord. God's like, watch this. What, 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 did they, what did David do? They, they gave him their yes. They stood and they obeyed. They listened. They still went forward, right? Even though, even though. So it looks to me like we have a part to play, doesn't it? It looks to me like when I, especially when I look at Old Testament, I see that covenant word come up a lot. And for those of you who are married here, you have a covenant with your spouse. I have a covenant with my bride. And so in my walk with her, my life isn't just she takes care of me and I do nothing. It's not, you're going to see knots up in this area if I was to attempt that, that type of covenant, right? That's not a covenant. A covenant is back and forth. And I just find it so interesting how God wants a relationship so much with us that he wants us to partake with him. He wants us to, sorry, to participate with him, right? And so, so we're, that's why we got to be a doer of the word. We can't just hear it only, say, that's good, Lord, I like that, I'm going to stand on it, I go to stand, now I'm being attacked, now I'm being pushed around, wait, what's going on here? Father, I thought, you know, why am I being tested? Well, we were warned that it would be tested, but what does it do when it's tested? Perseverance, and guess what you get out of that testing? You get a testimony, amen? And what happens when, when you go through something and then it comes back again later. So like, wait a minute. Like, really, devil? Haven't we already been through this? But oftentimes we're like, Lord, what's going on? Why is this happening to me right now? Oh, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. Lord, you did it before, or you did it in their life. Jesus, you did it for them. You can do it for me too, right? The enemy doesn't want us to go there, but so... We, our word is going to be, his word is going to be tested in our heart. And are we going to stand? Are we going to keep pushing them back? Are we going to keep saying, no, I don't care what comes. I don't care what you say. Symptom, I don't care what the doctor report says. I don't care. I'm standing on what God's word is. I'm going to continue to stand on what your word says, Lord. So flip with me over into uh, Jeremiah 23. Now we're getting some Old Testament here. Now we're digging back. If you hit Psalms, turn to the right. 
So, Lord, what's, what's your word like? He's going to tell us. You get to Jeremiah 23, verse 29. And this is the Lord speaking. The Lord says, it's not my word like a fire. It is in like a hammer that breaks rock to pieces? Wow. Okay. Okay, so the word of the Lord is something that is active. It causes, there's a cause and effect here, right? It's producing something in us, and God wants to produce his word through us. That's part of that covenant. That covenant means we're, we're going to allow that word that is becoming in us that we're standing firm on to come out of us, right? And so it's like a fire and it's like a hammer. And I think that's the only place I've seen in scripture that the Lord's word is referred to like a hammer. And the first thing that the Lord, when it comes to his word is like a fire that he brought to my attention and wanted me, I believe he wanted me to share with you is in Exodus chapter three. And you can backpedal there if you'd like. We'll have it on the wall for you. But in Exodus chapter 3, this is Moses. I love about this. Moses is actually writing this. So in chapter 3, and then I want to go verse 3 or verse 2. 2. Sorry, we're going to start verse 2. 3 verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he, being Moses, looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I'll now turn aside, you might want to underline that in your Bible, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. Get this, this is so key. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, And said, Moses, Moses. And of course, Moses says, here I am. And so the key word there was that he had turned aside. So the word of the Lord is like a fire in that it gets our attention. It's that heart knock, right? It's that we read his word, we hear his word, and we get that knock. And you can, has anybody ever had the vacuum person clean? Do they still do that? You know, vacuum cleaner salesperson knock on the door. And you shut the lights off and you hide behind the chairs. Not saying I've ever done that. But uh, and maybe you've been on the other side of that. I'm, I'm sorry if you were at my house. But you get that knock, and it's your choice to turn aside and open the door and let the Lord in, right? And so the Lord is going to highlight, there's going to be a flame of fire of his word that's going to say, hey, you need to pay attention to this. Will you turn aside? And the other part that I love to use, and we're not going to read this, it's like 30 verses, so we won't go there, but in 1 Kings 18, Elijah, a lot of, a lot of y'all know the story about Elijah, right? So Elijah is, is uh, the prophet of the time, and the king of Israel is getting everybody to worship Baal, and that's a problem, right? That's a problem in the land of Israel. And so Elijah says, I know what, guys, I'll tell you what, we're going to meet at Mount Carmel, not Illinois, right? Not, not on our Mount Carmel campus. Over, over in, in Israel. We're going to meet in Mount Carmel. And I, you, you set up your altar, your, your offering, and I'm going to set mine up unto the Lord. And we're going to call on, the, on whoever is God here. And the one that is God will answer by fire and will consume their offering, Right? And so some of you know this, and some of you may not have heard this before, but hey, I love to be reminded of the word of God, right? And so, so what happens? Prophets of Baal, they set their sacrifice up, they're dancing, and I don't know how they dance for Baal, I don't know, I'm not going to try and <laughs> try and duplicate that. But they're going around, and Elijah's finally kind of like gigging them a little bit, nothing's happening, right? Elijah's like, well, hey, maybe he's asleep, maybe you need to shout louder. So they do, they turn themselves up in a frenzy and they're cutting their self and stuff like what in the world I don't know what kind of party this is but I don't want any part of it right what's going on here it's kind of weird and so what happens we know that Elijah turns and he, and he calls upon the name of the Lord 
and the Lord answered. Oh, I'm going to help myself. I always do that. But what, what he did first, you need to know what he did first was he said, all right, guys, dig a trench around the altar, the altar and sacrifice of the Lord. And I forget how many gallons of water they got, but it was so much that it soaked everything. It completely soaked everything, filled up the trench with water. Elijah calls upon the name of the Lord. Fire consumes his altar, the, the sacrifice, the wood, licks up all the water, and that fire was so intense it burned up the stones of the altar and the dust and then consumed the, the sacrifice that the, those of Baal had set up. So the fire of the word of God, we know that nothing can stand against the word of the Lord, that even the impossible things like those stones were burned up. The word of the Lord will consume like a holy fire everything that stands against his sons and daughters. Amen? The things and the trials and the struggles that you deal with, that's the power of our God. That's the word of the Lord. And the second thing that he said, my, isn't my word like a hammer? And I thought, okay, Lord, where are we going with this? Because I don't know what other scripture to kind of jump to, to, to springboard off of this. And he started to highlight some things to me. He said, if I hired you on a construction site, and there's a brick wall, block wall, stone wall, whatever you want to use there, and I hand you a hammer, we got the word of the Lord, right? I might be able to do a 10, 15 pound sludge. I don't know, some of you strong guys might be able to do a 20 pound. I might, I don't know. Probably not a good idea for me to start slinging sledgehammers. But. And so if I take that hammer and I give it a good smack on that wall and there might be a little crack happen or some chips fly off of it, am I going to look at the, the one that hired me and say, well, that didn't work. And then just kind of walk off. Well, I'm not going to have a job, am I? And I'm not going to have a really good reference. You probably don't want to put that one on the resume. Showed up, tried what I was told one time. It didn't work, left, right? Not a good thing. But yet we'll do that with prayer. We'll do that when we want to stand upon God's word. I took a swing at it, Lord. I tried. Nothing really happened. Maybe a little bit. I kind of felt good for a moment. And then after that, well, no, right? If, you're, if that's your job, you're going to take that hammer, and it's hammer time, baby, right? You're going to town on that wall, and when do you quit? When it's knocked down, right? And we've got to do the same thing with the word of the Lord. We've got to do the same thing with that revelation that God gives us in his word. We've got to say, Lord, you gave me this word. I'm not letting go. Death is the only thing that's going to let me go of this word, God. I'm going to keep swinging and keep swinging and keep pushing until this thing's knocked out. I'm not giving up, Lord. I'm not calling it quits, Jesus. I'm going to stay put. I'm not going to give up on this, Lord God. And But we have. I have. The Lord's pulled my heart to, to share this testimony with you. Last, last July, I was... I had gotten up from dinner and my back goes crack and I can't move very well. Well, I've had three other back surgeries and so I kind of, the feelings and the things that were going on in my body, I'm like, please Lord, no. And I then in that moment, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. I'm standing on your word, Lord. I'm not budging. And I hurt so bad. And all it did was it got worse and worse to the point where I'm in bed. I can't stand up. I can't walk. I can't hardly lay down. I can't sit in a chair. I'm in pain so much that the only relief I get is when I can finally get some sleep. And that's only for short periods. But I'm praying, I'm calling my pastor, I'm calling my friends, I'm calling everybody I know that will pray for me and stand in faith and stand on that word with me in agreement. And some days go by and I'm still in a lot of pain and I, and I go to one ER and then, and then it's an insurance thing. Well, we got to send you home. I know you can't walk or anything, but insurance says you need six weeks of physical therapy. I'm like, I can't stand up. How am I going to do physical therapy? And I've been down this road and my heart's starting to, to melt. My spirit's starting to, 
to dry up because I'm like, Lord, what, I don't want to do this again, God, because it's just this big messed up process and, and the pain is just, I don't wish this pain on my worst enemy. And I'm like, Lord, what do you want me to do here? And I kept praying and I kept standing. And I go to the next ER and they look at me and I'm having, now I'm having some pretty big complications and they're like, hey, we, we're going to have to admit you. We, we can't send you home in this shape. And, of course, I'm thinking, hallelujah, somebody, you know. And uh, I get admitted. And so I'm in there for a week, waiting for, or almost a week, waiting for the insurance approval so that I can have the surgery. Like I said, I've done this before. I don't know what that's like. And they're pumping me full of the most powerful pain medicine they have. And they're just rotating stuff over and over and over. And I'm praying, God, by your stripes, Jesus, I'm healed. <laughs> And I'm having this moment, I'm watching the game show network. And the first time I went to the ER and the second time I went to the ER, it's kind of weird. They said, hey, do you have sleep apnea? I'm like, I don't think so. Well, when we give you this medicine, you try to stop breathing. Okay, I might want to check into that later. I'm laying in the bed watching the stupid TV show. And I start to, have, start to have difficulty breathing. And I hear so clearly, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to smother you and take your breath. And I would love to tell you that in that moment, I'm like, ha ha, get behind me, Satan. I was trying to, I was trying to stand. And in that moment, I'm like, Lord, I just can't anymore. And it, in that moment, and I know it sounds silly on the backside of this, but in that moment, I, I, I'm convinced that's it. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die. And I'm just sitting there watching the television. And Amy, she looks at me, she goes, what's going on? And I just said, I, I think I'm going to die. And she goes, you know what you need to do, right? And I'm like, I have been. I've been standing and I can't stand anymore. I can't take this anymore, God. What do you want me to do? I'm still standing. I believe in what your word says. And now it's it for me. And I'm so thankful, y'all. I'm married up big time. She, she just not stirred or shaken. She goes, gets my phone, puts worship music on because she knows that the spirit of the living God roams the earth and looks for those who will worship him. And when that worship music began to play, the peace of the Lord began to come into the room. She did, she said, shut that TV off right now. And she played that worship music and the peace of Jesus started to come into that room and I was able to finally get some sleep. I'm awakened by my phone and it's pastor. Hey, Greg, I just wanna pray for you. Every word out of his mouth was like it was coming from Jesus himself, and I needed every word. And I fall back asleep, and the presence of the Lord continues to increase. And my boss calls me, and he loves Jesus too, and he says, I'm praying for you, buddy. And I believe in the name of Jesus that when this is over, you're going to be better than you were before. I'm declaring that when you wake up, you're going to feel so good, and you're going to be in such good shape. And I'm like, I didn't say this but I've done this thing three times already. I know what a painful process it is to recover from this. And I know what it means to wean my, have to be weaned off of pain medications and do all that. But I fall back asleep and the peace of God continues to rise up. I wake up and Matt and uh, Lewis walk into the room and I hear the Lord say, I've sent my mighty men. And they come alongside me and take hold of me and pray. I couldn't stand anymore. But the Lord sent me people who would, who would partner with me. By the time the nurses came to take me to down there and, and Lewis and Matt followed me and Amy down to the OR and it was a long walk. It was a long way. They kept me in my, in my uh, hospital bed. I was ready. Let's do this. Let's get this. The fear was gone. The devil was gone. Jesus had showed up and Jesus was now having his way. 
I can tell you that when I woke up, I felt amazing. The pain was gone. But during that surgery, the surgeon had to come out and talk to Amy and say, well, I, we just want you to know we had to stop what we were doing. He, your, your husband was so full of narcotics that we had, he, was, he, was stop, he was trying to stop breathing. And we had to push Narcon through his IV and wait for that to settle in so we can proceed. The enemy was trying everything he could to kill me. But Jesus, but Jesus came through. That night, I have a vision, and I've not had any pain medicine since the surgery. My mind is sharp and clear, and I'm just in all the presence of God because it didn't leave. It came in. He did, all right, bud, you're good. I'm gone. He stayed, and he remained, and in fact, he remained for weeks. But in that hospital room, he gave me a vision, and that vision was of all these beautiful little hearts floating around in front of me, and I look at him, and he is this big, beautiful heart. And he has an arrow pointing to all the little hearts. And he's telling me, this is where my heart is with these little ones, with these ones that you love where I go to the nations and minister to. That's where my heart is. He goes, I know you want your heart to be here, but the way you're doing it now is not the way. I've got to stand. I've got to stand on his word, on his promises, what he has declared for me. And is you want to go ahead and stand this morning? We, what we need to do is whatever situation that we, we're brought in, put in, whatever word that the Lord has given you that's been challenged, and maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, Greg, I don't think I can do it anymore. I've done it. I've prayed. I've stood on the word. Where's my breakthrough? Unbeknownst to me in that moment, my breakthrough was just right around the corner. And don't you know, the enemy shows up in spades, if you will, when it comes time. When he knows that you're getting ready to have your deliverance, look out, right? And you might be here and you might be ready to give up. And Jesus is saying, stand, stand, stand. Don't move. Don't move one inch. Stand. You take his hammer of his word and you say, you know what, devil? I'm going to give you another one. Bam! I'm going to give you another one. Bam! You keep hitting him. As long as you've got breath in your lungs, you've got that prodigal, you've prayed and you've prayed and you've stood and you've prayed, keep praying. Don't give up. I can testify to you that if you don't give up, they will come back. My daughter did come back. Jesus will watch over his word and perform it. And if he did it for me, he'll do it for you. So if our ministry team would please come forward, we want to give you an opportunity to respond to the word this morning. Will you turn aside? Maybe it's someone that, that you can't forgive. They've hurt you in such a way that you just don't even want to speak about it. Maybe it's Maybe it's the Lord that you feel like has hurt you. Maybe there's been some disappointment in your walk, in your life. Lord, I thought, I thought things were going to turn out this way, Lord, but they turned out this way. Where were you at, God? And he's, and he's inviting you. Let's talk about that. He wants to reach you this morning. If you have, if you have anything going on in your body, we, our altars are open as well, that the Lord wants to touch just like me. I get to go to the nations next month. Take that, devil! Yeah, come on! You thought you had me? No, I'm going to stand on the Word of God because, yes, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed, I am made whole, and I'm not giving up. Till my dying breath, I'm not giving up. And I want to encourage you this morning. The Lord wants to encourage you this morning. Don't walk out of this room with your head slung low and saying, well, God, that's fine. I don't know if it can happen for me. His eye is upon you. As we sung this morning, the word Ron had, he's reaching out. You gonna dodge that shepherd's hook or are you gonna let him pull you in? Maybe you're lost this morning. Maybe you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. You've not made Jesus your Lord and Savior. This morning is that chance. This is that knock. 
this is that knock. Will you turn aside and allow the Lord to minister to you? Will you take this opportunity this morning? We hope you enjoyed this message today and that you connected with Jesus. If this message has changed your life and you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you can text the word NEW LIFE to the number 618-243-0900. We would love to celebrate with you. If you would like to give to the ministry of The Rhodes Church, visit our website www.theroads.church for all of our giving options. We would also like to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive notifications of our Sunday live services and to discover more of Pastor Chad's teachings. And now we pray that you experience God's presence throughout your day.